Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix online meeting 232. We we're just talking about the removal of the number sign. It's just meeting 232. It's not like I ever spoke the number, so I don't think it'll be anything lost from the audio, but we're gonna start dropping that number sign because the Octothorpe is way too popular amongst all these platforms and turning into something that it's not. It's just a number. Anyway, 232, that's what we're doing today, end of March. Uh, these meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now, and those of you that were searching the internet for Octothorpe 232, you will not find this meeting, I'm sorry. What are we doing today? Uh, if you're here, go ahead and say hi. Oh, I love that. We have Blair. It's great to see Blair today. Uh, what are we doing? We are doing triage. And actually, we have a bunch of stuff to triage. And for that, Bob has blamed Sean. So uh, I think we're going to go jump into that. And then we'll do questions, comments like we always do. But we have plenty of things to triage. I don't know if we'll get all through all of the triage issues. We'll see. Um, and then we will go from there. Bob, you ready? Absolutely not. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm. Too right. many issues. All right, but so yes. I, I'm sorting these the other way around. Normally we start with the oldest, but I'm going to start with the newest to make sure we get through the things that people opened as opposed to old stuff that Sean found that we should uh, definitely put in the correct place. So we're going to start with the, the newest issue here. And uh, Sean, take it away. I'm not sure what to do here, but the <laughs> in uninstalling an MSU is not supported silently anymore. The, the rationale is insane. They understand that, right? Uh, MSUs are, uh, as far as I can remember, always per machine. So you always require elevation. You're on the other side of the airtight hatchway. Being able to uninstall them silently is not a vulnerability. The fact that you could uninstall them silently was the vulnerability? Uh, mm -hmm. Right. The I fact mean, that you could means that, hey, you're already on the machine. Have a nice day. Yeah. yeah. If you're on that side, why don't you just delete the thing so it looks like they're there or add stuff so it looks like they're there, but they're not. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's silly. But what does this mean for us? Does it, is it, are they going to fail? Silently not, oh, fails with ID8. Okay, there we go. Um, or yeah, event, yeah, what do they return from WUSA in this case? I don't know. Yeah, because we haven't seen this yet. This is coming in the future. Oh, no, it's, it's already been deprecated. For years. Yeah. Like the first build of, first real build of Windows 10. <laughs> um... It's not, I mean, we it's probably not a huge should loss. Up for a minute. Yeah, it's probably I not mean, a huge loss. How many loss. people uninstalled them? Yeah. Intentionally. With their bundle. Yeah. yeah. That's probably the answer is to just what remove KB. I mean, or do we use KB to try to detect them? Or can you even detect with KB? I knew KB. No. I was we there don't for the use uninstall. It to detect. Yeah, we just use it for the uninstall command. Um, so. That means we can get rid of KB. We keep the detect condition, right? And that's that. And remove we permanent. Could theoretically, remove permanent. Yeah, probably from... remove permanent. Yeah, it's probably the right thing to do. Yeah, I wish we had detection built in, so we could keep KB, but we don't have it, and. Without uninstall, it's useless. So. Yeah, and one last thing to specify when you're throwing an MSU in there. I, I don't know. It's yeah, painful. It's not like they ship the detection logic for all these anyway, which would be really nice if they did that. But they don't. So um, we should probably do those things. Uh, we should do them now, probably. Sean, do you want to do that, or you want to drop it on my side? I guess I could do it. I don't really want to. <laughs> well, you can give it to me, and I'll maybe I'll do it on the stream. It'll take me. This won't take me long either. But it won't. Whichever. This is not a big deal. So, if you really don't want to give it to me, otherwise we'll go from there. I'll let you decide who gets it, Sean. I mean, ideally, you would go into burn and delete that code too. 
I don't know if you want to do that. No, I don't really want to go in testing all the MSU stuff either. So that's the part that's like, yeah, I could do the. You want to split it again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could split it. All right, give it to both of us, Bob, and we will split it like we did uh, the other uninstall one, or whatever the other one we split was. I feel like that was yeah, an uninstall related un issue too. The un uninstallable? Or yes, uninstallable. uninstallable. Yeah, that thing. All right. Yay. I got half a bug, which unfortunately is the same as one bug, but whatever. Okay. Which version do you build with? 3.11. Oh, sorry. Uh, first, next. Oh, look, this is just purely an. Yeah, this is another accessibility issue. Which, yeah, great. Let's put it with the accessibility space and be like, yeah, it'd be great if someone wanted to go do all that. That works for me. So, yeah. Uh, remote payloads should not allow hash information to be specified with certificate information. Right. Uh, so hash and size on authenticated verified payloads will never be used. It's also confusing to users when validation will actually be performed. Which validation will actually be performed? Oh, I see. Whether authentic code or hash will be performed when in the end it's only authentic code if authentic code is specified. Got it, right. And compiler. So the issue here is that the hash today is used for the cache ID and size was left if being able to download. So that was the thinking there. And John brought up that, yeah, hash shouldn't be used for the cache ID. I should not. Um, and that the size is not used for verification, which is true, but it'd be for progress reporting. So it has questionable value. I, yeah, I don't know. I guess it depends on how much you think the things change when the authentic code signature changes to so whether it's better to have zero or something. Um, oh, if zero is declared manifest, then it would what, get updated after that. Oh, hi, Ron. Welcome. Once someone implements that issue. Oh, oh, once four or 5,000 is implemented. All right, so we could allow size to be specified, but it shouldn't be required. Okay, is size required? I guess it's required right now. Hmm. All right. Yeah, hash and size are required, which makes no sense. Well, hash is required because that's what cache ID, I think it's required. Oh, I guess it could be not required if cache ID was provided. But then we got well, into the whole, do we want cache ID? should not be used for cache ID. That's fair. I don't know what else we use. Well, the thumbprint. <laughs> no, like, the thumbprint could be the same across many packages. Well, the exe name underscore thumbprint underscore. The exe the name is, is not stable. That's whatever they put in their build lab. Yeah, but the whole point is you only want it to be shared if it's the exact same file. So if they don't, if two bundles don't use the same one, then they'll be duplicated in the, uh, in the cache, but that's better than colliding files that don't, that aren't the same. Yeah, that I, I, that's, that's fair. I, it's just a matter of finding the, the, uh, the new name. What do we use for the new name then for the cache ID? Like exe name underscore thumbprint. But exe name may not be unique. Could the just exe be, name. Could be just VC readist thumbprint. And that could be the same for XA6, X64, all those things. Well, that happened when they republished the existing .NET Framework redistributables. Names that, didn't change, but the thumb, thumbprint. That, did. that would actually be oh, okay. That would be okay. So, that would actually be okay. That would be okay. It, it, can't you look can't at original the file, file name somewhere? Is it not in the signature? The, the file name is a user specified thing. It could be renamed on the machine. It could be whatever. So, yeah, no, there's no there's no name in the, the signature to get. If there was, I'm not sure that that would be unique. You, know, you could use setup.exe. You shouldn't use setup.exe, but you could. That's the challenge. The file name is not something we can use as the cache ID. I mean, we could force everybody in using remote payload to have to specify a cache ID so that it would be a manual cache ID. So you have to specifically say whatever, but then if different people harvest uh, the you know .NET framework, then they'll all get different directories. 
just, ah, I don't know. Um, yeah, this is the problem. There's no unique identifier that's stable across all these things. Well, the hash is not unique either, so I don't think that's a fair... No, the system. hash isn't better. I, the hash is what we used in V3. So the, the current behavior is the same behavior in V3. Why don't we just use the hash of what we downloaded? We should be able to use something in the signature to make it unique. I you can so. sign they're, multiple they're signing, files with the same signature. How many people have different certs for... No, not even each. Microsoft does. Microsoft signs all their stuff the same certs, at least within a division. They may Office may have a different one than Visual Studio, but all the Visual Studio stuff is signed with the exact same certificate. I think all of Microsoft is signed with the exact same certificate, for example. The certificate is not a unique a fire. I know the certificate's not, but ideally there'd be something in the signature itself. Like the hash of the file? Like the timestamp. The timestamp should be unique. It's going to be the same as the hash. It's going to be the thing that was true at that point in time. Well, the timestamp is part of the signature. Yeah. So is the hash. I mean, it's in there. The problem is that there's not really anything innate. Well, anything. The hash would work, though, right? The hash yeah. of the file? Only, yeah. only if everyone that uses that file uses Authenticode. If, if one bundle is using hash verification and other bundles using authentic code verification, then authentic code oh, verification I... puts something in there that doesn't match the hash. Wait. Mm -hmm. uh, what? If you use the hash of the file, we, we, we verify the hash after we download a remote payload, right? Not if it's authentic code signed. Sure, 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 sure. But I'm saying, sorry. Normally, we have the hash in the manifest, and we verify that hash in the manifest against the actual hash of the file. For a hash for, verification. Okay, so we could hash the downloaded file and use that hash as the cache ID. Runtime decide the cache ID for the authentic code signatures. Right. That's not going to work for detect. No, nor detection of whether it's been cached already. Right, right. Which will so be that doesn't bad. Really, really work, yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah, that wouldn't hold up well. I mean, I th I think exe name plus thumbprint is better than hash. pretty easy to get into a state where set up uh, you have multiple setup.exes all named the same like that just the, the assumption there is that all the setups are named differently from a company across all the architectures and everything like that. although different architectures presumably you're not installing them the same no you do though like vc Ritist is the one no i think they've now put the architecture in their name right it's not oh. just vcredis.exe anymore. Yeah, but, well, <laughs> no, they have been inconsistent. Yes. And further, people have been inconsistent. Um, <clears throat> for example, you can get the vcredis from, from MSDN, uh, whatever it's called now, Digital Studio Subscriptions. <clears throat> yeah. And that has this long-ass name, long butt name to be PG-rated. The... But you know, you go to the download center and you get a much sh shorter one. And I'm not even sure if the oh. ones you download today are consistently named. named. They don't like. Yeah. They certainly don't have a version number in them. Yeah. And the, part of that is because they're trying to combine all the redists. Yeah, like they don't. They don't hold those names 
sacred. Well, so if you if you use the exe name plus the thumbprint plus the timestamp from the digital signature, that should be pretty. That should be more unique than the hash. <laughs> Uh, why? What? How is the hash not perfectly unique? Yeah, I. I mean, hash is ideal, right? But it's not clear to me that. Only if you assume everyone's going to use authentic code verification for the same payload. I'm, I'm still missing something. So. Let's say you're installing .NET 4.8, and the first bundle to, in, to cache .NET 4.8 is using authentic code verification. Okay. So it downloads a file that's newer than the one it was built with. Okay. So it's, it's going to cache a, a file that doesn't match the hash. So then another bundle later runs on the same machine. It's using hash verification. So that file in the package cache is not going to have the hash that that bundle expects. So that new bundle is going to have to re-download it and delete the old one. Sure. It, it, it will show up as a corrupt ca cache package, cached package. Right. Yep. Same as in V3. Yep. I mean, I thought that was one of the things that Blair was complaining about when we were talking about bringing this back. Was where a file would get cached, even though it it matched the authentic code, but didn't match the hash. Well, but but the the problem of the problem is that at least is recoverable and automatically so. You don't have to you as the user or, or the bundle developer don't have to do anything to get the correct package on the user's machine. But if we're not checking, but in the case of authentic code verification, it, if we're not checking the hash, then it's entirely possible that you would get the wrong package and there'd be no, you know, no indication. From Burns' perspective, it's all good. We, you know, we need uniqueness one way or another. So if we don't, we can't, and, and I agree, we can't use, again, for detection, we can't use the actual hash. So the user needs to specify cache ID, and we can recommend that they put in a GUID. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, that's, you know. It's at interesting. A point, at a certain point, you're, you, you have to accept that you're going to get, um, you're going to get more downloads. That's that's an interesting point. Here is that yeah, the solution is pick a unique identifier, and everybody should use that. And if you don't, well, then you're wasting cache space. But that's okay. Right. Correctness I mean, is more important. Mm -hmm. Do hash plus certificate for authentic code. Just hash for hash verification. I don't know what hash plus certificate gives us oh i see oh that's that's true Blair. that would avoid it if we put both the hash and the certificate in the cache id then if you used the authentic code you'd get one and if you didn't use authentic code then you just use the hash one and everything would work out hmm, that's an interesting way around it too is that better than the GUID? yeah because that would get everyone using net to have the same one without having to look at which one wix chose the GUID would. The GUID way? No. Oh, the hash. The hash plus certificate. Everyone, like that would be a stable one that even if you don't use the Wix authoring, everyone would get the same cache ID for the same EXE they downloaded. And when it changes, that's okay because that's the whole purpose of the authentic code verification. Um, I'm okay with that, except I think it's problematic to call it hash. It The hash implies that, at that point, the hash is a GUID. It's just a unique identifier. 
I would suggest that if we keep hash plus certificate, then then we should not in the package groups we supply we should not use a, a real hash. We should come up with stable, unique identifiers. If we want to put them in hash format, that's fine. At that point, I would just go with a GUID and say, if you're using the you know Wix NetFX extension package groups, you're going to get unique IDs, and they're not hashes, even if that's the attribute name. But why? Why what? Why wouldn't we use the one that you would get if you ran the remote payload subcommand? Because so that, we're trying to save space on people's machines, I thought. Uh, yeah. But again, I don't... Uh, correctness is way more important to me than, than downloading an extra 80 megs. But Blair's scenario, they hear with the hash with certificate and just a hash um, versus versus just having the hash. That can be all done in the binder. It's essentially just setting the cache ID, and you can set right. the cache ID to saying, oh, if you're doing Authenticode, we will put the certificate on there. If you don't, then we'll just give you use your hash ID like we always have for Xyz. So I, that's pretty no, straightforward. I, I, I agree with that. I'm okay. agreeing with that. I'm just suggesting that calling it hash is is misleading. But it's not. It's the hash of the file. It's the hash of the file at the time. It's Correct. A snapshot. Correct. It's not the hash of the file that's going to be downloaded after you know three days or however long it takes Microsoft to rev these things. That's correct. Which, granted, in certain cases like NetFX, it's not going to keep happening. But well, it will. But maybe it'll be monthly rather than three days. It's it's fine. I'm just suggesting that calling it a hash, having the the name the attribute name be hash. And the content in the package groups that we ship be a hash, a real hash of the file at that point in time is misleading for something that is also authentic code or authentic code checked. At that point, we could provide a cache ID. And that wouldn't require any change. Correct. We could. Uh, we still can author the cache ID, so that would do that. No, not build time, Blair. That changes it way too much. The whole time thing doesn't make sense. You want it more stable than that. The file's not changing every time you build. so. And it's a remote payload, so we don't know the hash except, again, at that point in time, that snapshot when we create the package groups. Now, yeah, you could maybe so, assign time. That's what Sean was saying. But I, even then, I'd just use the hash. That's... Same file could be signed many times. I'm also looking at the you know funnel of success. I want to push people toward doing the right thing. If we provide cache ID in Wix NetFX extension, then anyone who copies from that authoring, which you know certainly everyone has been doing and will probably continue to do, that leads them toward success. If we provide the cache ID, we get both correctness and um, optimiz you know, optimizing to reduce downloads. It, for all the people that are using the Wix authoring. But if they go yeah. and do their own, then they'd have to know to go look at our cache ID and copy it. Um, well, yeah, but again, people start from... Yeah, I, that's the question. Right? Do you think they start from themselves or do they you know, steal from the Wix tool set first? Of course they steal first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I wouldn't hell, I wouldn't create my own. Of course I'm going to start with you know stuff something that has the, the, the especially NetFX given the number packages. of command line parameters there are. Exactly. The NetFX package groups are not to be trifled with. So that says for NetFX set the cache ID. For people just My using case. this, do we use the hash plus certificate? If cache to calc, should we generate the should the algorithm for generating the cache ID change to 
hash plus certificate if certificate is available. Yeah, that's better. I still think it's weird asking for the hash, but I guess it would still be used in this case. Well, we don't ask I, for it because you generate this. I mean, it's generated for you. It's not asked for. The hash is not generated for you for Authenticode. If you use the remote payload command, it is. Well, yeah, I've used the command. Well, I mean, I, I guess if you type the, the remote payload in by hand, I don't know how many people are going to do that, but yeah given the amount of data you have to provide. So that being the case, that command could generate a cache ID. All right, so here's the other thing. You could say if if you have a cache ID specified and the authentic code certificate specified, hash can become optional. Yes. That's, yeah, that's definitely true. possible. And I don't know what to do about size. So sorry. So I think that's that's probably the thing to do for hash. If you specify cache ID, and you have the certificate information, then we have everything you need for caching. So we don't need a hash anymore. So hash no longer is necessary. You can specify if you want, but you don't have to. Um, and then is that and if you don't specify a cache ID, you need hash ID because hash ID plus certificate is what we're going to generate as the cache ID. Is that the summary? Yeah. Sounds right. All right. Great. Good idea there, Blair. We'll take that one. All right. Size. I, I think some size is better than zero size unless this feature is implemented. Because it's going to be closer than zero. Um, why, why aren't we getting the size at download time? I think that's what this is about, isn't it? Yeah, I mean the the problem is is that you like project the park progress reporting is you're giving a like how many total bytes. Oh. Uh, so. And we yeah. don't we don't do we don't do a head first. We don't do a head during detect no, or plan. No, we do not go out to the internet before you've done anything else. Sorry, why do we need that during detect or plan? Because we don't have the file. I, yeah. So Why do like, we need the size during detector plan? Well, when when progress we progress is during apply. Every time we give cache progress, we're telling the BA here's the total bytes we've gotten, and here's the total bytes we need. So we'd have to do all the head requests at the beginning of caching in order to not cause that total bytes to increase while we're caching. I, I'm still inclined to say, let's put the size in there. So at least you have a number that you can guesstimate based off of. And then it would be great if this 4,500 then would fix. I think, you know, if you if we find out later, hey, the number's different, fixing it, we probably should do that. I mean, the Windows installer will do that. They'll adjust your progress as they're going along. Yeah, um, that's true. And so, I mean, I'm not against that. But I'm, I'm zero size versus a size that was... A previous version of this, the the previous version feels correct, closer, more useful. I don't know than zero. What? So again, putting it on the on the on heat. What if heat generates size, but it's not required? We could make it not required. That's true. But although that point just puts zero. But yeah. Well, um, I I don't mind. Huh. We've accepted that generated code is usually not as pretty as you can get with hand authoring because, you know, human intelligence, for the moment, um, will beat what we can get out of heat. Um, so I'm fine if, you know, heat generates extra things like, you know, cache ID GUIDs that normal humans wouldn't. But it's like eh, progress. Eh. So I, I essentially we're saying that size becomes optional, and if not present, then it's going to be zero. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what other number are you going to pick? Um, a thousand. <laughs> well, yeah, two GB. I don't know. Over the network, 
two GB. I I I got nothing. So we can make size optional. It just means it'll be zero. I still think we should fill it in by default. Um, when doing the yeah. the generated version of it. Yeah. Okay, so the, the change here is to make hash sometimes optional and size always optional. With the certificate. Yeah, hash sometimes optional, aka when it has a certificate and and a cache ID. Yeah, size is required if it's not if it's hash validation. Oh, right. Yes. True? Yes. Uh it's not strictly it true. is. <laughs> Oh, because you use the size to validate that the correct file is in place. Yeah. Could you use zero size until the actual size is received and suppress or modify the appearance of the product until I require. Yeah, that's Ron. Your the, your point is the I think what forty five hundred is basically getting at the when zero comes in, need to update the data that we thought we had with the actual data from the server and go from there. Yeah. Size is required because it's used in the hash verification. When when you're doing hash verification, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. That and that makes sense to me. Because I remember that though. I'm still I'm a long, long time ago, back when before MD five was broken, there was some people um there there was some argument saying that it was harder to generate a cache collision if you bolt, if you knew the size of the output and the hash. It was very hard. If you had the hash and you had the size of the result, it was hard to generate a collision, basically. So it was an extra level of, of collision prevention. I don't know if that still holds true today. I haven't. Well, we're using SHA-512. Exactly. So, but we. I don't know that we need to remove the uh, the check from burn since it's already there. Okay. Because it's not wrong. It's like the file should be this big. If it's not, you probably got the wrong file. Because the hash isn't going to match unless it's an imposter. At that point, we don't want it anyway. So it's not a bad check. It's an extra check. I don't know if it's a security check anymore, I guess is what I would say. I mean, I think it is because... I don't know. Like, like, I, like you said, there can be lots of collisions with the same hash. Right. Like, but I don't know mathematically how hard it is to generate a collision with a given size anymore. I just haven't done the, the, um, the, uh, I, I haven't done the analysis. It used to be that way, but that, that information was years ago. I don't know how good they've gotten at hash collisions anymore in space. And shot 512 hopefully doesn't have those problems. If well, I mean, you, you shouldn't be able to get any collisions at all with a hash. Otherwise, the function's broken. That's the point. <laughs> like MD5. Like MD5. But like most of the attacks that you'll see will rely on adding extra content to be able to get a collision. Yep. And I don't know the math if they've gotten around that problem or not. That's, that's all I'm saying. I just have not done the studies. Or I haven't read people doing the studies. How hard is it to create a collision with the exact same size of data? It's fine. Well, it's already there. And and again, heat is going to be the primary method that people use to generate these package groups, including us. So it is the way we do it. So and just to be fair, this isn't in heat anymore. No, it's, it's in the Wix burn command. Sorry. Generic Generation, code generation part. Yes, code generation space. Blair, if you're doing a hash, you already know the size. You know the size of the hash, but the hash doesn't tell you the size of the content. And what burn has is the size of the content. And if you're doing a remote payload with hash verification, you don't have the file to be able to calculate the hash. You're relying on the user to tell you what it is. Yep. But if you're generating the authoring, it knows because... That's how it generates. The exactly. Hash. Yep. Yep, yeah. yep. So got it. Yep. Yep. So size becomes optional. Hash is op is not present, and hash is optional if cache ID and authenticode certificates are specified. Is hash still optional if you're using authenticode? 
Yes. It's it's completely ignored if you're using okay. authentic code. All right. Unless it's used to generate the cache ID. If you don't have a cache ID, then the hash is necessary because uh, it will be used to generate the cache ID. I, I, I still disagree that it's a good idea to do that. Why can't I, so my summary, and maybe this is just you know me editorializing, is that cache ID is required if you're using certificate verification. You're saying cache ID will default to hash. Plus the certificate. A data block with a given size and a given hash cannot be unique if the size of the data exceeds the size of the hash. Sorry. So we could make the statement that you can't, we won't use the hash and you have to specify a cache ID, but that opens us up to the things that Sean was bringing up before where it's more likely people will get those different. They could be different. If we use the hash, then at least drop some space. We're like, yeah, it's probably the same for most of these cases. I also worry about people specifying cache IDs because they have to be globally unique. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a good idea to ask people to provide a cache ID. Yeah, I, I don't want to generally point people in that direction. I did, sorry, I thought we agreed that we would generate the cache ID for the package groups supplied in Wix extension. Sure. Okay, well, then we're pointing them toward cache ID. Again, not, not for their own stuff, though. So... We agree that no one handwrites these things. Everything, everything is getting generated. No, I don't agree with that because there are other parts where people are like, it'd be nice if the remote payloads could do this or this or this. So people are using it for their own things. I'm not suggesting people aren't using it for their own things. I'm suggesting that when they use it for their own things, they're generating the remote payload off. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. So that being the case, I, I, and we agree that the generated authoring is going to include the cache ID. No. No, we're not. Well, oh. Yeah, I thought the generated authoring was going to include the hash. So, sorry. So, Bob just made an interesting point. You could say instead of putting the hash in the remote payload, just generate the cache ID with the hash from the hash and the certificate and put that as a cache ID and don't have the back end do it at all. Yes. I mean, you could do that. Again, I'm, I'm, my concern is we're overloading hash here. Um, it, it, it's, yes, it's the hash at the time of harvesting, but if we're explicitly ignoring it after that point, it seems really weird. No, that's you. It's a very good point to use cache ID to essentially always require a cache ID. Sorry, to do what this bug says, which is remove hash from remote payload completely, and instead of using it to flow down to set cache ID the way it was in V3, just in the generated code, write cache ID right up the front. I thought that's what you had already agreed to. Well, actually, Blair, what I had in my head thought to do was. Keep the hash in there as well as let it flow all the way through. And in the back end, it would, if a certificate uh, was available, tack that on. If not, keep using the hash. But this would put it up front and center, get rid of hash, get rid of all the confusion. And size then always becomes optional. Because cache no, to be, will always be specified. To be technical, like... no. No, because you can still get remote payloads that have hashes. You only right. can remove the hash ID if they're authentic code signed. Yes, okay, so that's the other pivot. When generating code, that generation code can run in a mode that's not doing certificates because you may be doing this remote payloads for things that are large but are not signed and therefore you want to go through it. So we still will need to have hash ID. Okay, so all the things are still on 
the table. It's just we could generate the cache ID. If you're doing authentic code, we're going to generate a cache ID for you. If you're not doing authentic code-based remote payloads, then we will generate a hash for you. Which becomes the cache ID in the back end. Which is also the cache ID in the back end, correct? Yes. Because it's the best cache ID we have. Yeah. Size um, is optional in both cases. I thought we were I pivoting still, for I think size can be size is required if you have a hash. Okay. For hash sorry. Certificate verification, hash and size are are not allowed. And cache ID is required. No, I think size is optional. Size can yes, be optional. Size is optional. Hash is forbidden. Size is optional. Yeah. And cash ID is required. Yep. When doing certificate yep. based things. Yep. And then when you're doing hash verification, hash is required, size is optional, and cash ID is optional. Size is required. Size is required with the hash. Size is required. Okay. Good, 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 good. Yeah, none of these overlap perfectly. It makes it a very, it's a very interesting no, matrix. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a very interesting problem of language design, but yes. Just trying to thread people to the right answer. Yep, exactly right. That was way more exciting than I thought it was going to be. We are not getting through all 23 of these today. Because <laughs> I don't feel like it. <laughs> I'm also very glad we started at the beginning. Or the newest as opposed to the oldest. All right, so Bob, did that give you enough note-taking time? It did. Oh. Um, we still have to decide who's going to do it. I'll take it because I, I, I was in this code. This is not going to take me that long. I've, I've been in here fairly recently. With all the rules in place, it will not be that hard to do. Okay. So I knew I was going to get more bugs. I didn't think I was going to get all of them. Well, let's not go through all the bugs then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess that gives me two weeks to try to get caught up uh, or more. All right. Wixproj support for multi-arch Wixlib. Sean wants this. I think some people will want it, yeah. Uh, it's not supported in Wix 3 today, so it hasn't been a big push in the past, or at least nobody's asked for it until now. I think the BA is where people will want it. Yeah, what's new in the BA that causes this to happen more often? You have to have a separate architecture for each BA. Like each BA will have multiple architectures because the bundle needs a BA with the right architecture. But would you not build a? Are you you're not thinking that they're going to build a 64-bit bundle with a 64-BA uh, XA6 bundle with an XA6 BA ARM 64 bundle with an ARM 64 BA? Yeah, but don't you want one single Wixlib? that has all three BAs in there? I think most people are going to multi-target their bundle at the top and have the platform flow down to a project reference to their BA code and have it all hooked together like that. And that, that would well, be what I would expect. We have the problem today of shipping Wix standard BA in multiple architectures. Oh, it, yeah. I mean, if, if you're creating a redistributable, you absolutely have this problem. Well, it's... I mean, it's not limited to redistributables. It's a problem for internal teams that are creating BAs that need to target multiple architectures. The, the technique we're using today, um, which is we have one Wix Proj that compiles three different files, one for each architecture, each of which includes a file using the preprocessor with all the platform-specific authoring. It, that works for, for us. It works for Wix because we don't tend to have, um, you know, very complex Wix libs, but Wix four relying requiring the architecture up front means it's it, it it's going to fall apart more quickly than it might have in V three. No, it was the same in V three. No, no, it's different because right now our authoring is not. Uh, our authoring is not generally relying on the compiler extensions in their Wix libs. Okay, so because because we're not generating, you know, we don't have components. We don't. Our extensions, with a few exceptions, don't tend to use each other. Uh, certainly at the at, to use, you know, the 
um, compiler extensions, right? So for us, we don't care that the architecture is, say, x86, even when we're compiling for ARM64. But as soon as you have a Wixlib that contains a component, you care. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and that was... That's why I'm saying it's not different in V3. It's the exact same problem in V3. V3 had the same thing. It just so happens that when you're building these multi-architecture pieces the in the Wix tool set, like our own space, we have, don't have components, so we don't have a lot of the implications of this. I totally agree with all that, but it's the same in V4 as it was in V3. It just hasn't changed. That's no, why this has... It's gotten worse in V4 because it's no longer possible to entirely rely on on authoring when you're setting your architecture. It was frowned upon in V3, but it was possible. And that now that's no longer the case. Every single custom action is now, for example, a platform-specific reference. That wasn't the case in V3. V3, almost everything was x86, and you had to take special care to get the x64 custom actions, like in Util extension. Okay. I'm, just, I'm, I'm saying it, you're right. The class of problem is the same. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But the implications are, are bigger in V4. And, and also, if you want to build your BA once, put in a Wixlib and then just use that forever. Absolutely. That's the perfect, that's a perfect case where you'd want to do this. But what I, I think I've seen most of the time is the, if you have a custom BA, then you have that project and you have the bundle that depends on it. You build the bundle, it builds the, the C-sharp project, whatever, that gets included in with the bundle and you just ship it. So the, the architecture that you set for the bundle is the architecture that you would get for your BA. I th that's the way it's been done most commonly. And if you want to create your BA in all architectures up front and then share it with however many bundles you have downstream, which is a totally reasonable another way of doing it, uh, then yes, this would become much more important. I, I totally agree. I'm not, a, I'm not against a feature. I'm just saying I, I, it hadn't happened in the past. I wasn't curious what had changed going forward. And given the way I think I've seen most projects laid out, I don't think it's gonna to happen to a lot of BAs if they lay out this way. If they don't lay it out this way, then yeah, this will become more, more important or more useful, definitely more useful. You can always use separate Wixlibs. I mean, the, you know, nothing's impossible with the current structure. That's true, you can always use separate Wixlibs, an x86, x64, ARM. But that does make it more complicated to redistribute. Yeah, you have to ship three things instead to, of one. Sorry. Or no, however many. No, redistribute. To share. To share, and, yeah. Because it's a Wixlib, right? I mean, we're talking Wixlibs. Although... Wix extensions, you know, come a close second. But. So, I, I, true, but there's a, there's a feature we're still missing that I don't know uh, what to do with, which is the uh, problem that we're having in Wix 4 with... The, that we've done with our, what's it called, the CA suffix, where we have the yep. XA6, XC4, ARM64, and then we yep. use an extension to hide the fact that we're picking a different architecture underneath based off the architecture that the compiler's in. You need an extension to glue that together. Correct. If you had a Wixlib yep. here, you'd have to have a preprocessor variable that gets set to the platform that then matches whatever unique identifier that you appended to all of the things inside your Wixlib. Um, and all that. So like there's a whole bunch of um, extra glue you have to put on top of the Wix today to put multi -architecture, multiple architectures into a single Wixlib, given the fact that we have not solved that problem generally. Yep. Yep. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Now, that said, yeah, I know the preprocessor is pretty common. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, you, you, you do this with the preprocessor because one, you have to, because you have to have yeah. the identifier set at compile time so that they can be resolved at link time. So sorry, we sorry, forced not, you not even, into the preprocessor. Not, not even identifiers, um, although that's, yeah, also an issue. That's the showstopper, it, but yeah, okay. Well, it's certainly a big showstopper, I agree. So I, I, I think there's there's a set of feature, there is a, I think it's larger than just this, 
when we yeah. get down to the, if you really want to make this scenario work top to bottom really well, there's more to it than um, just this part. Like if we just step back and say, okay, what does it mean to build a multi-architecture Wix lib in a way that is easy to consume? What would we do? It's not just Wix libs. I, I agree. Your your point about ID generation is spot on, and we it's we need a, a general solution, um, whether that be you know, templates or whatever for um, multi arc products in general. Yeah, and I I think it's even beyond it. It could even be on go beyond templates if you yeah. want to be able to do this without having to insert an extension, right? I mean, you think about it, it's yeah. like yeah, yeah. how much work we have in the extension. Not yeah, we have like we have explicit infrastructure and patterns designed in across our extensions and the way that we author to make sure they all glue together in the end without having to do lots yeah. of manual work. Coming uh, up, I would disagree. I had to do a bunch of manual work to make that work. <laughs> Sorry, without having to write explicit. In each extension, at least we can reuse it across them. Anyway, so it's just like uh, there's something to solve there generally. I, I totally agree. And what with burn BAs, we have one more use case where it'd be useful if we had such a thing from top to bottom. And yeah. and I don't think it's actually templates. Maybe templates are part of the solution, but I still think there's something beyond templates. Yeah. That when we look at templates and trying to reduce the abuse of the preprocessor, this is going to be, if not the top, near the top of the set of problems to solve. Yep, I agree. Uh, this architecture thing. It's like one of the worst, uh, most common uses for the preprocessor today. And it feels like almost all of it's because we're missing features in this space. So yep. all that says, I don't disagree with this. I don't know how important it is in V4 without those features and given the way I'm, I'm anticipating bundles being built, or at least I'm hoping, because otherwise this becomes more important, like Sean said here. That's kind of where I'm at on it. So 4X? Yeah, 4X or 5. I mean, 5 is like, you know, one of the big things that I want to try to tackle in 5 is to essentially remove the preprocessor um, to remove all the patterns that it's used so that we can get away from having a preprocessor. And this will definitely, what we just, which is why this is such a big thing in my head of if V5, how do you solve all these problems? So anyway, yes, uh, it can definitely move to, I don't think it's 4X, I think it's Vnext, but um, I don't, but, well, it, but it could be done in 4X. This specific problem. This could be could solved be in 4X with 4X. enough yeah, with enough MS build, MS build goo. I don't know how ugly it would be, um, but yeah, it's definitely possible. Cool. All right. Cool. All right. Six, seven, four, four. I have to remember the numbers are going down. Uh, variable name with loc variable stays unresolved. Variable name with loc for a variable. Oh, a variable with. All right, a variable name with a loc variable. Okay, read that. I don't know why that was so hard to read. Uh, it stays unresolved all the way to the manifest. Okay. Interesting. I wonder how that slipped through. I didn't think that localization was generally discerning when it was being resolved. I thought it resolved all things. Yeah, it's an interesting bug. I don't really want it, but I'll take it if nobody else gets it because it needs to be solved in four. But I don't really want to hunt this down myself. But it does need to get fixed, so. It's in the ID. The variable name is assigned to the ID value. Oh. That's how it's slipping through. The ID value. How fascinating. I'm Sean, do you know where the source code for this is? You link to the test, but... Source code for what? Was my link bad? No, the link's fine, but it's the source code to the test and not the authoring. Um... But, okay, I, I just, it's, I, I can't visualize it, so I can't 
I, I don't know what you're saying in words. It'd be test know. data bundle with invalid. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not going to be able to It's going to look that. something like variable. Wow, if I could spell. Variable name equals bang look. It's not right in the R type. Look, dot, 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 foo. Value equals x. There. Something like that. It's going to look something like that. Inside a bundle. And the issue is that the name gets put into the ID and the ID is not resolved. It's an interesting bug. All right, I guess I have to is take that a it. Bug? Yeah, it's a bug. The ID, ID with that, that a, should be supported. Loc variables and IDs. That you're saying that should be supported. Well, it has. I mean, it can't end up in the manifest that way. <laughs> so, like, so there's a, there's a couple of different ways this could be solved. One, the the resolver could evaluate. Um, IDs and replace them, which I'm not, I'm not sure that's a good idea. I'd have to think about that one. Um, yeah, thank you. That's my, my concern. As a general, IDs could contain line time variables. That seems... Right. So probably icky. the better solution, or the probably the end solution to this is the variable symbol should have a name field and the I, name should not be the ID. Okay. So that you can have the variable, the the look variable in the symbol field, and that would then should just get resolved normally, and then it goes from there. Then you'd have to do it back and check to make sure there's no duplicate variables. That's kind of where I'm. I'm. This this turns into a key problem. It doesn't do that today. It's depending on the linker to do that check for it. Then yes, then you'd have to add that check as well if the link if it's dependent on the linker to do that ID check. Yes, yeah, so this is a challenge with loc variables and IDs because I don't know what else you do. I guess you could say that that's not a valid variable ID, but in the end, the name is the ID. For this in the burn manifest, so you'd have to do that. Yeah, so yeah, that's kind of a mess. Is is there a variable ref in the bundle? No, I don't think so. Yeah, but it doesn't really need an ID. Yeah, it's one of those. It has an ID, but it doesn't really need an ID, which is why this probably has slipped through for so long and nothing's ever really right. noticed. It's like, oh, you got in the grand shift to IDs. Well, clearly this is the ID because it was, and then it just got stuck there. And then, and the whole way bundles were being handled was very uh, unique in V3 compared to the way um, MSIs were. So it might have just been getting picked up by something else. So it's just, I can see how this slips through um, with all of that and just have to decide the right way out. Dang it. I guess I'm going to have to take this one because I have to go think through the implications of this. Stupid symbol. Ah, all right. Fine. That was mean. That was very mean. At least let me get off the page before you sign it to me. <laughs> That's what you said. <laughs> um, six, seven, four, two. This is actually pretty nice, although I don't know why he removed the template. This is going to be a great bug, except then to because this actually came from a Stack Overflow issue. And I had to manually add triage because GitHub was having hiccups and not doing all the typical things it would do. Anyway, um, this is a great bug. We need to fix the language code in this particular loc file in Wix 4. Because apparently one of these languages, the CS language does not exist since 2006 has not existed since 2006. I, I'm glad I don't work in loc normally, right? Like changing geopolitical issues ends up affecting what languages exist. It's like, oh, I guess you just build systems to handle that. Anyway, 
Does somebody want to do some whistle changes? It should be pretty straightforward. Move this file to the right place. Doesn't have to be me. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll I'll take it. Um, I'm curious though whether this is something we want to do in three eleven or three fourteen rather. Oh, I hadn't even thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, why would we do that? Um, no. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the right solution is in three fourteen. In terms of yeah, three fourteen. Copy the file and edit it and do it yourself. So in four we would replace it. Yeah, because okay. Cause his point, I think, of him. His point is that you know the CS language does not exist, and since two thousand six, so we shouldn't keep supporting it. Okay, sounds good. And by the way, that language is now RS, so you should go support that. It's like oh, okay. It turns out all the text is correct. You just have to fix the LSIDs and the language identifiers. It's like oh, okay. Very straightforward geopolitical change. I wonder how you make those decisions. Who gets what codes and when they get changed and when they don't get changed and things like that. You know, it's like interesting problem. You wait for the war to be over and then. Well, that's definitely, I'm sure that's part of it, but, or a large part of it, but still all these numbers. I wouldn't, do they ever reuse numbers? I imagine this is like an ISO level kind of thing. If not, yeah, ISO you're right. Helps. You're right. It, it's a big committee thing. It's not like there's one person inside Microsoft making these decisions. All right. Um, now we get into things that were not put in any place. Just hanging out there, not assigned to any milestones or anything. Um, oh, reference in my coming pull request. It's still open. Oh, it's in three. That's why. Oh, it's in four. Oh, we immersed it in four. Yeah, four. Oh, okay, great. So three fourteen. Yeah. Although, to the latch lack of Dutch. Yeah, we'll put three fourteen. It's still open. If we take it, it'll be yeah three fourteen. That's great. It's a language thing, so or additional language. All right. Can install simple per user bundle x64 with Sanberry burn integration is failing. Signed to Bob. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Still on the old Six six seven eight. Six six seven assigned to you. Um, do you want to keep the issue assigned to you? And no, just remove it from me and we'll, if it if it gets closed because three fourteen gets closed. But it's it's safe. So we're not going to put, so this does not go into 4.0. It's, it's in only, 4.0 already. I, I'm i assuming. Sorry, the, I, issue, the issue. No, 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 no. It does not go into 4.0. Okay. But you want your, you want your name taken off 3.14 issue. Yeah, I don't need to be assigned to this. All right. Can install and uninstall civil per user bundle. 6676. Currently assigned to Bob, who's glass clicking on the other one. Um, Mark is skipped because he's making assertions. Is it still Mark skipped? I didn't even look. Yeah. All right. Good. So it probably should go in four. Preview one, because um, I've either been fixing bugs that are Mark skip, or I uh, want to go add an issue to them if I find them, so that we know that they're still skipped, because otherwise they'll get lost. Util close application description incorrect. Okay, doc bug. Yeah, this is does not match its type. Both terminate process and reboot prompt attributes description mentioned that have no. It's an integer type. What is the real type? Yes, no type or integer. Interesting. Uh, okay. It's a matter of going and fixing the dock. Uh, this is currently assigned to me. Put it in preview one because we need to um, resolve all the bugs and all of these issues in preview one. So I have other dock bugs that'll continue to roll with those. Unable to build after updating to version 3.14. Is this ice? Ah, this is the cubes. Yep, this is the cubes. Yay. 
we have an answer for this last week or two weeks ago. Oh, it's all, it's all, it's all happy. All right, this is all set up. Great. I don't know why that, is. oh, it's March triage. Okay. Uh, wait, are we, am I missing something? Is there anything else no. to this issue? Okay. We, we, yeah, I last commented 14 days ago, so I just forgot to remove triage. Very good. Very good. Where are we at? 1040? All right. Let's see how far we are. A ball downgrade. This is closed. You should just go to the bottom with my comments. The initial fix for this cause, this cause 6722, so it was reverted. However, the root cause for the complaint in the mailing list was fixed by getting the engine. It's not playing there. Oh, downgrade. Okay. There are two things to consider here. Okay, should we try to re-implement the change to skip the successful page so the user doesn't have to click the install button? Oh, skip to the success page. Should the suppressed downgrade fe failure feature be moved into the engine instead of Wix standard BA? I don't have strong opinions. Skip the successful page so the user doesn't have to click the install button and fill out any required information. That's interesting. I don't, do you have thoughts, Sean? Opinions? I don't have, I'm not deep enough into this to have strong thoughts either way. Yeah, I don't really have strong feelings either way. These probably should not be sitting on a closed issue in the end if we're gonna do anything with them. So I guess that's probably what we need to decide here. So do these get promoted to anything? Okay. It was fixed by getting the engine to not do anything during a downgrade. Should we try to implement a change to skip to the success page during a downgrade? As in, you don't even have to click a button. Yeah. How would you do that? You would detect the downgrade and then the first page you see is successful page. Or a failure. Oh, right. Well, the context of this bug was you had suppressed the downgrade failure. Oh, <laughs> right, of course. That, that's the... Yeah, right. It's just the opposite of what we do today. Yeah. I kind of like that idea. Success. This thing is a newer version. This is already installed. Yay. Right? So it's a success instead of a failure. Kind of. The problem is we don't have great... We... Uh... Uh, well, okay, so actually, Sean, let me ask you this. In what you've done so far in V4, have you added um, look strings? I hadn't noticed. I have. You have, okay. Okay, good. The, the advantage, quote-unquote, is that for other than the prereq BA, um, the, the normal Wix standard BA is not localized, which kind of sucks, but it means we don't have to worry as much about um, disrupting what's already localized. Do you so, mean loc strings for this specific issue or just in general? Well, the, the reason I ask is that the files in use page or files in use dialog um, until I looked, I thought, oh crap, I need new look strings to do this. Now it turns out V3 already has files in use look strings. And we don't we haven't localized Wix standard BA, we've just localized prereq BA, because that came from I believe dot net. Um, or Visual Studio rather. So we can freely add loc strings. 
I guess yeah. I'm not <laughs> I'm not saying anything useful. We can freely add loke strings because we don't have strings in other languages than English. So for this issue, we could add a loke string to describe the scenario. We don't have to live within trying to squeeze it into an existing um, we don't have to try to live within existing look strings, which caused you know a number of problems during 3x when we added look strings and then had to you know fall back if it was possible to do so. So it sounds like you want to do this. I'm or stuck we, on the second one. Do I didn't. I didn't hear that at all. I'm stuck on the second one. I'm st stuck as in questioning the answer or questioning the yeah. question. No, no, no. The the question is valid. The yeah. uh, implementing it. If we don't implement it, that means that if you don't have a U, if you run without UI, then a downgrade is always represented as a failure, right? So it essentially would change that failure to a success. Uh, that sounds right. Yeah. I'm okay. <laughs> Uh, not four. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, yeah, I don't have enough value on that one. That's just meh, meh. That's where I'm at on that. I guess so. Not for me. If other people thought it was really important, I wouldn't fight over it. Uh, but, so I'm willing to take number one um, as a. Uh, nice to have. All right. That's fine. You can put it in four and see where we're at, at the end. We're going to do a, a triage of four issues in the not too distant future. Um, so we could see where we're at by then. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm. Oh, oh, oh no. At, well, I don't know if you want to remove the. Oh, yes. Remove the triage. Well, sorry. Sorry. You didn't reopen the issue. It's fine. It's all good. Sorry. No. Don't reopen the issue. <laughs> okay. Why fine. not? Is not changing the. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, no, I guess it is what this issue is about. All right, so number one is what this issue is about. Yeah. Okay, very good. Sorry, my bad. Very good, 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 good. Carry on, carry on. Very good. <laughs> my bad. Ignore me. Sounds, yeah, okay. I don't have strong things. All right, let me see here. 1048, how many more of these do we have? Half of them. Let's do this one, then we'll stop there. Um, patch created using purely Wix does not include changes to XML file table. Yeah, interesting. Filtering doesn't follow the references created by extensions. Yep. Yep, it'd be great if it did. This is a fantastic feature request. It does not do that today. So, V next. I'm sorry, I'm confused, and I made the comment that it was, yeah, two and a half years ago, uh, almost three years ago. Um, filtering doesn't follow. Why did I? Why that sentence? That's horrible. Um, well, it's horrible. I don't understand it. it, it there, I'm not seeing. You're saying the default filtering, not not explicitly authored filtering. Correct. Or sorry, I'm saying yes. Oh, that's that's my my guess to what you're saying is that unless you explicitly reference these things, then it doesn't pick them up. Yeah, which doesn't surprise me. Okay, Cause, cause, it doesn't surprise me either. Yep. Thank you for interpreting for me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's the I'd like patch filtering the the built-in patch filtering where I don't have to tick over everything and do everything manually. That, you know, so you have two modes, one the automatic one and the you take over everything and do all the filtering yourself. The When you do everything yourself is really kind of annoying. It's very detail-oriented, 
it would be very precise, but very annoying. And the automatic one falls down rapidly on a lot of cases that it just does not handle because it's not smart enough to handle all those different things. Could it be smart enough? I don't know. I haven't been in it deep enough to know that it, if it can be perfect, but it probably could be smarter on this particular case, but um, there's quite a bit to it. Yeah. Um, well, you you know or will know more than I do about it. I'm curious why, like in, in the default case, when you're not filtering, it's not automatically detecting changes in custom tables. But yeah, that's interesting. And there is a workaround, so. So is this a breaking change? Is that why it's V next instead of four X? Oh, I, I, sure. it, we well, could put it four X, but. Well, if we do, then. Uh, it probably would be breaking. Potentially breaking. It'd yeah, be breaking it probably would down. be breaking. I, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I expect this is non-trivial, I guess is really what it comes down to. Well, I would like to put a breaking changes label on all the ones that are breaking. So we don't have to keep on remembering. The fact that this is whip re required is the part that for me is that triggers the whole, someone needs to sit down and design this cause I, it's not trivial. I, I don't know that it will be breaking for sure. But it definitely needs someone to sit down and think about all the implications of it. Well, if, if something, this is all with the, with automatic filtering. So yeah. there would be a behavior change at least. That, that's true. That's true. There would be a behavior change. Yeah. You would be getting more, you would potentially be getting more stuff than you did before. Right. Mm hmm Yeah. So, it's an interesting feature. Uh, it's not easy to implement. I, I expect it's not easy to implement, but I didn't write a lot of the patching stuff either, so we'll see. All right, Fair we're gonna. You'll know all about it. Unfortunately, I'm going to learn more about it because patching is one of the things I'm going to be doing at the end of preview one at this point. All right, we're gonna pause there. That'll leave us a few issues next time to definitely talk about. So let's talk a little bit about next time and other people's questions comments. So uh, if you have questions, comments, go ahead and start leaving them, writing them, leaving them in there. Um, I am gone in two weeks, the seventh. So I would vote the next meeting being on the 14th. I know that will mess up our Thanksgiving, but that honestly will put things very quite nicely on my schedule if we just skip the seventh and go fourteenth. I don't think we should skip to the twenty-first, which is the other option. I think. Um, I think we'll have enough stuff come in before then. Do you guys have any thoughts, opinions, cares of the world? Yeah, hopefully we don't get a whole bunch of issues in the meantime. Yeah, but we'll have some waiting for us when we get there too. Uh, so I, I think that's the, the thought process is that we'll be back in three weeks from now, which is you know, a little bit longer, but uh, just going to be out of town. So I won't be here and won't be anywhere to near a microphone or keyboard and all that kind of good stuff. So we'll probably do that. Anything anybody else wants to talk about out there? Trash was a bit more exciting today than I thought it would be. All right, great. I see Blair and there he's W. Two means in a row. It'd be awesome. Although we seem to have lost a Jacob, but we have Ron. Ron, great to have you here. So we'll see what happens. All right. I think this is. Well, I was, I was going to ask questions about documentation, but uh, this has gone long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us a hint of what you're going to ask? Well, I have nowhere to put my new bundle variable that I created. Like that documentation doesn't exist in four. And then also I can't merge any of my changes to preview one because then people looking for preview zero documentation will, will be looking at things that aren't in preview zero. Uh, so I'm less worried about the latter problem because we haven't published Agreed. the documentation much. I, I agree that the general idea of it, but I'm the specific in this case, I'm less worried about. Um, and the first one, you can't add it to the XSD. Is that not where it goes, or is there somewhere else that it needs to go? No, there's a 
page for built-in burn variables. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah I didn't I, port over any of the the existing B3 yeah. non-reference doc. Yeah, we need to... Mostly because even if the structure is fine, which I would probably disagree with, um, the content is, of course, all B3 and not B4, and I didn't have a solution to make that possible. Yeah. Well, I so... mean, I'd, I'd rather have the skeleton there with wrong information than nowhere. No, I, 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 I picked the opposite. I picked the opposite when I was putting together the, the, the first website. So it's, it, you know, it, it, it's entirely possible. I, I, well, I take that back. First of all, I did not want to port the existing um, files themselves. The structure would be fine, but I didn't want to port the existing files just because most of them are really bad internally. Like, you know, they're, they have an, an MD extension, but they're mostly HTML. So I just I didn't want to port them over, and then I did, and then separately I did not do the work to you know create skeletal structure. So um, I, I know we have a a large doc uh, work ahead of us, um, and. We, we can talk about when we want to, how we, we need to eventually talk about how we plan all of that work. And we should talk about whether that happens in the preview one timeframe or can it happen after preview one or, or both or yeah. Or, well, I mean, maybe you guys want to do it separately, but I don't like doing it separately. I want to do it at the same time. I make the code change. No, no, I agree. I, I we should we should have this you know, we should have spots. I, I don't disagree. I just saying when I did the original work I did not put over the V three and I also did not um, put the skeleton in place. The the other problem it's we have is the, the other problem we have is that the current site doesn't isn't gonna handle the way things are laid out, we have a problem to solve, which is the what do we do with the V3 and the V4 content and getting the site to handle that? And we don't have that anything in place for that. And it's going to, and making that happen, I think, is a interesting thing to sit down and figure out. So we could, I mean, if it's a matter of copying content over and dropping it somewhere, we could do that. I just, we may just be creating work of copying a whole bunch of stuff that we end up not doing. I, I don't know what the best way to through that is. And it's, it's just a, a problem that we have to tackle as a whole for the doc problem and hopefully set us up so we don't have this problem going forward where it's easier to move forward with future versions. But we just don't have any of that in place right now. V2 well, some was... of that's separate from you know documentation versus website. I, I don't want to conflate the two. Okay. And V3 I don't... had it nice. V3 had the chum, and the chum went into the, into the site. Yeah. Um, we've tended in v4 to treat the two as the same thing but they're not they they, they should be separate not to you know disparage your concerns it's a major problem that we're going to face because we have you know decades of juice you know, to sort all that out yeah. um and i don't really like i don't like that the documentation is separate from the source like i have to commit to a separate repo and that people are going to see new documentation even though the code's not released. I mean, maybe I'm alone in that, but I don't like that. Well, we had the other problem before where we couldn't get changes to the website because we had to commit the code to the documentation inside the code. So we're, we've had negative experiences on both sides. Um, so I, 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 we haven't solved it at all right now. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a problem. We have to do that. I, 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 I agree, Sean, I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong and I would like to have it a spot where yes, it's, we made the change stock. I've been trying to, as I've been changing the XSD, change the, or sorry, change the compiler. I changed the XSD at the same time, knowing that I still have a gazillion elements that have to be scrubbed. I will need help doing that too, as well. So I, I totally get that. And in this case, you need a different page of the documentation uh, to be brought over. 
which we just hadn't done anything for. So maybe it is bring that file over, put it in the spot where it would go in before, and we'll drop add the content to it. Of all the pages, that's definitely one page that's going to have to survive the list of all the burn variables. Sure. I don't, I don't see a good place to drop it today. So there isn't. There's no. There's no skeleton. No, I, there's nothing. I. I well, I, I want to say there's nothing, but there's there's not. It's there. There are some bones, but they're like you know, the bones in the cranium and maybe a clavicle, <laughs> not a full skeleton that you can hang stuff on. It's just again that this is. I did that work for PV zero and yep. and you know, I haven't I haven't gone back because it's a big chunk of work. And I, again, I, I'm not hugely in favor of, I, well, I don't like the files. The files were all originally HTML and we did minimal conversion to get them into Markdown. Um, they could do with some real Markdownification um, in addition to updating all the content. I'm also, you know, I'm thinking there's a lot of content that could be restructured and, um, and some that just we don't need anymore. Uh, I don't know how much, you know, uh, information architecture we have the brain power to pull off in before, during, and after PV1. Yeah, I mean, that's so, definitely yeah. my struggle right now is I haven't even, I just know it's a problem. I haven't thought about it other than knowing it's out there. Yep. <sighs> So I, I don't, I don't we just don't have an answer right now, Sean. Unless you want to tackle the whole doc problem, but <laughs> I think it's going to take more than one person to get through all of that in the end. I have more than enough to work on already. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we all feel that way. So it's, I, th I mean, the fundamental truth is right now we are absolutely prioritizing getting the code of the Wix tool set in place and tackling the presentation of the documentation and the website and all that kind of stuff is secondary right now. And as such, uh, waiting for us after the primary thing is solved. I think that's where we're at right now. Well, I mean, I can merge my stuff, but I, I will need a place to be able to update documentation when I change something. Well, maybe create a spot of to do's or something, or a document, yeah. or like, and just be like, this has to be added to the docs, because then at least we're not losing it, and it's it's close to some of the other things, um, and we'll be like, oh, okay, that stuff, we have to incorporate those things, and it'll be something will be written, and it might even be the final content has to be written. We just have to put it in the appropriate markdown document, indented to get the bullets to line up, and that would be ideal, kind of thing. But at least we won't forget it, which is honestly one of the bigger problems that I've had getting through everything. So you're saying to create an issue, or you're saying to create a random file in the repo and start sticking stuff in it? Create a file in the web project near, near the XSD stuff or something like that. I haven't looked at all the places it could go, but yeah. I mean, that, or, or create do, an issue. To do.md in the root. To do.md in the root. Yeah, that's honestly not worse. And say, this needs to be added to content that was on this kind of page before. All right, great. Wherever that page ends up, add that content. Or if you want, put it in an issue, write the markdown in the issue, and then when we get around to it, go through all the issues marked doc, and we'll suck them all up. That's not terrible either. It's not much different than the to-do in the end. Okay. Either one of those would work. Okay. We've had plenty of time for the chat to come up with other questions they might have. Blair said the 14th works for him, so that is great, which means we will be back in three weeks. One, two, three. Three weeks, uh, but same time. Probably doing about the same thing, although that gives us three weeks for something exciting to happen in between times. Not that I'm expecting it, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, so I think that's it. Three weeks, same time, 9.30. In the future, sometime in April, we'll do this meeting again. And uh, until then, you guys all take it easy. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.